In this episode, I describe a recent lesson that I taught in order to illustrate a practical application of some dressage naturally principles. And this will help you understand how I strategize in my approach to the challenge. And hopefully it'll help you be able to strategize better too. So here we go, episode 186, Principles in Practice. I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony. Because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. Hey, how are you doing out there? <laughs> you doing good? It has felt a bit like a, a weird week here. I mean, but not just here, just out there, been hearing some things, <laughs> other people's. <laughs> anyway, I've just felt some weirdness this week. Uh, so I just thought, um, before I jump into this episode, I would just kind of check in and uh, maybe we can just take a, take a deep breath together. <sighs> I just think, you know, chances are in the biggest of biggest pictures, it's probably going to be okay. Anyway, just for some reason felt I needed to say that. <laughs> anyway, I always <laughs> feel like when I do these podcasts, like I need, I need some like witty banter. I think I've said this before, but I listen to other podcasts and often, well, I guess they're podcasts when there's more than one person and they have this like witty banter leading up to it. And, you know, it's just me. (laughs) Don't get me wrong. I can, I can talk to myself (laughs) like a champion, but most of that isn't going to be anything that anybody (laughs) wants to listen to (laughs) anyway. But I did come up with a joke. <laughs> so <laughs> I was thinking about this. I'm like, well, come on, Karen, come up with something funny. So I made I made a horse joke. And uh, I don't know, maybe this joke exists already. Uh, but I'd never heard it. So here's here's the horse joke that I wrote just for you guys. Okay, why are so many horses so oppositional? Well, they are naysayers. Anybody? Anybody? Is this thing on? All right. All right. I won't quit my day job. Let's get right into the, uh, (laughs) the normal part of the podcast. All right. So today I taught uh, a lesson and I thought, you know, even though it was a, it was a pretty basic lesson, but sometimes those basic things are actually, you know, not normal. It's normal for me but I think it's worth talking to. And I thought the other reason it'd be fun to talk about it is because it was a chance to really think about the, the principles that were underlying the lesson and how those principles were applied in action. So, you know, there's lots of people who have principles and guidelines and things like that, and they can sound really good and they can look really good written on a, a meme on Facebook. But when it comes to going, all right, well, what do I do? Like, that's a nice principle, but how is it actually applied in real life in action? So that's what I want to do today. And in doing that, I'll be able to kind of talk you through the logic of what I did. So the kind of the the background processing in my brain that led me to the decisions I made and the exercise that I, I chose. And then you know, so I could talk about that and then how it worked. So let's kind of paint the picture. So this is a um, very capable rider. She has a fairly new horse. Um, it's around seven, I think, but very, very green. Had a late start and she's done the start herself. And he's going really well. He's right on track for where he was and where he's going. And the owner is just trying to give him some more exposure, be able to not only ride him at home or not only take him out for a trail ride, but to be able to go out and, you know, have a, a, 
a, a lesson, go to, you know, an arena kind of ride and focus on that even when he's away from home. Um, so she brought him here and did a really nice starting him on the ground, gave him lots of time to settle in and do some games on the ground with obstacles. Uh, but she had said she wanted to come in for a lesson um, because she's been, you know, on the good days at home, she can think about creating the alignment and the stretch and trying to um, get more consistent about finding like, okay, what's the working gate? And she said in, in playing with some of the dressage naturally exercises like basic alignment and things like that, that there was some stickiness with him yielding or moving his, you know, changing his balance, moving his weight. And this is such a clean slate. She really wanted to be conscious of any time she felt like, oh man, I'm having to use a little stronger aid than I'd really like. So I really, I really love that because she was wanting to focus on the biomechanics, which is kind of on the happy athlete training scale. It's like the third priority, right? So we need some happiness. We need to have some harmony. We need to have some communication. And now with that communication, we can start affecting um, directly his way of going. So I love that she could sense, okay, I'm, I know I'm ready to be doing this, but there's some communication breakdowns. And she noticed that and didn't say, well, I just, now it's time to move better. I'm just going to put my aids on stronger and you have to move better. She was like, no, I want to really highlight the communication at that edge. So she's a dressage naturally student. So she gets it. Now on this day, when she got on him, he definitely was still a bit distracted and he gets a little bit, was a little bit nervous, uh, not nervous, but just a little unsettled when she went to mount him. Uh, then he did stand qu quietly, but then kind of hurried off a bit and was just tending to, yeah, be, be distracted. His attention was outside all around. Um, and when he moved, he was tending to get quick and more flat. And then because of the tension and the flatness, he was getting unbalanced. And his mind was, it wasn't so much fearful, it was more um, distracted and then overwhelmed and super busy. Like kind of the way she described it is like, I don't know what to, I don't know what to think, of, think about. There's so much stuff to think about and I can't think about anything. And then his attention was kind of far away rather than close. So I let her just show me a little bit about what's going on. And again, this is a, a very lovely, sensitive rider and she was following him well, but I could tell by, by how she was riding and I could tell by the, um, the short reins, <laughs> you know, good hands, but short reins, I could tell that she wasn't really feeling trusting in the moment. And she was tending to try to like help him and get managing him a bit. And that's one of the things that I look at is going, wait, there's more, this doesn't look easy enough. You know, she's a little bit like, mm, I'm going to stay kind of close to him and didn't feel like she could give him um, a loose rein or a long rein. And I think she was right. I think if she had just dropped the reins, he would have just gone faster, 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 gotten more unbalanced and probably more stressed out. So there could be a good case watching him to say, hey, he needs help. Let's show him what he needs to do and balance him and regulate his tempo and stand him up on the inside so he doesn't cut in and bend him so that he's not bracy in the, sh in the shoulders. And some people might be like, hey, get his head down and supple his neck back and supple, that word was in quotes, you know, get his head giving, you know, yielding to you in both directions and, you know, a little bit um, sort of getting control over his body so he can't run off and he can't look around and he can't fall in. So, um, you know, the physical is one of the doorways in, but it's only one. So if I, if I look at him though, using the sort of filter of the happy athlete training scale and, you know, the big picture of dressage naturally, it's like there's too many issues in the foundational bucket, right? So not in general, but today in this moment. So he was definitely emotionally stressed 
not thinking. He wasn't able to do the things he, he knows how to do, right? So it wasn't that he didn't know or he was being obnoxious. He just was emotionally in a place where he couldn't do the things he knew how to do. So whenever there's mental tension, that to me always jumps to the top priority. And maybe you can go through a different doorway in, but you, you know, it, it can work. But in my experience, like you better be really good at it <laughs> because the risk of adding more pressure, more aids, more control, less freedom and choice with many, many horses can just make them more emotional. And even if it doesn't seem to make them more emotional, they still didn't necessarily learn anything inside themselves because you just did it for them. You kept them slow. You kept them bending. You kept them on the line of travel. So I like to approach things a different way. And part of the whole sweet spot protocol is to kind of step back and look at the whole picture, you know, from mental, emotional, physical. And um, well, this brings us to the principles, right? So I think about the main principles of dressage naturally, and I this on my website and you, there's a whole podcast about it. But I thought about the first three principles. Number one, the basics of dressage are for the horse and should feel good to the horse. Principle number two, everything comes from and returns to relaxation. And principle three, mental, emotional, and physical development are equal doorways to our goal. So those are the things I wasn't actually thinking about that in the moment, but they're floating in my subconscious all the time. So instead of deciding, okay, let's get Lisa using more aids and controlling things. So it looks like it's working even when it's not. The goal was to um, gain his attention, be worthy of his attention, somehow cause his attention to, to go where we'd like it to go in a way that was going to create real suppleness and lead to ultimate relaxation mentally, emotionally, physically. So in a way that the horse would feel better, I mean, we're guessing, (laughs) that's a pretty good guess, that we want to feel like the horse is going to feel better at the end than in the beginning. That stuff wasn't just done to him, but at the end, if he's going around going, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I'm so, you know, "Ah, where do I go? I'm tootling off. I want him to be like, oh, oh, we're here. This is just like home just different, right? So that I want to think of, what do I want my horse to be saying or feeling or thinking at the end of the session? And yes, permission to anthropomorphize a little bit. Why not? If it helps us to create a strategy, then go for it. I can do that while still knowing he's not a human and he doesn't actually think that way. (laughs) Oh, and P.S., at the end of all this attention getting and relaxation and feeling good, he's going to be moving better also. So that's sort of, I take the main goal that he came, that, that the rider came with, I want him to be moving better. And I, I, this moving better or the better movement becomes a side effect, <laughs> a really nice side effect. So I kind of thought for a minute, I, I had already told her, Um, we're going to ride in this one area where I have a lot of obstacles because as she was kind of describing how he was feeling that day, I was like, we need focal points, right? It's really hard to tell a horse like, pay attention here. And he's looking around going at what? It's a blank arena. (laughs) Oh, my aids. Okay. Well now I have to put more aids on to give them quote, something to think about. So I like to have visual things that they can actually have a thing there to think about because a a distracted horse thinking about a thing in the near environment is better than thinking about a thing that might happen outside in this new scary place or something like that. And every horse is different. Your horse might be like spooking and stuff, (laughs) but in general, stick with me here. All right. So, um, so I wanted to have, we had him in an, a, a small arena, well, a small, a small fenced in area. And there were lots of barrels and poles and things like that. So immediately she had something to do. And I was like, just aim for things and let him step over these poles, walk around those poles, turn around these barrels and just start 
feeling like you're always going somewhere to something. And even if it's just a simple turn that you make when you get there, that's good. Then we started adding on this one thing that I, one request from him. It was really going to be the only request she made of him, which was to do this kind of bendy turn around the barrel. So picture you're walking on a a loose rein and as you approach the barrel, it's kind of like as it gets to like the horse's nose shoulder area, you start having this idea of like, oh, hey, well, let's turn around the barrel and imagine that your inside hand floats up and takes just enough of a feel to kind of indicate that his nose just tips a little bit in that direction. While at the same time, your inside leg um, and your seat shift so that it causes like a arcing away from the inside leg. So his hind legs and his front legs are now moving sideways and he's sort of looking at the you know, he's got his nose pointing at the barrel. He's moving sideways around the barrel with a beautiful arc in his body. And once you feel like he has some steps of that, you can either just stop and relax or just let him loose and head off and align to another barrel. And so we took a minute to just develop that move uh, by itself, just from the walk, just to make sure that, that she and the horse had this move walking along ready float that hand up tip the nose shift your weight to the outside a little bit of yielding from the inside and a way to create an arc so all of his legs are crossing and stepping sideways softens his body nose pointing you know at the barrel not like 90 degree angle to the barrel just soft and then let it loose and he can either stand still or you can just lift your focus and go to a different barrel. So we practice that like that. And he, let's see, he knocked over the barrel a whole bunch of times. <laughs> so he'd like crash into the barrel. This is just at the walk, really slow walk. Crash into the barrel, knock the barrel over. I'd pick the barrel up. Next time he'd, you know, slide out past the barrel. Then he'd come back and then he'd chest the barrel again. <laughs> knock it over again. And this is all, I mean, it's very, this is not hectic. (laughs) He's just, we're at that edge, just enough that he couldn't pay attention to the solid object in front of him. So we had a little giggle about that and I kept picking up the barrel. And anyway, so we (laughs) got to a point where it's like, okay, he's got the idea. He can go around the thing. The rider's able to let the reins go looser in between and um, with just little adjustments was pretty much able to make this transition uh, from going straight next to the barrel to arcing around the barrel and then letting him loose again. So, and so now we said, all right, well, let's, let's trot. And I tempted her to, instead of thinking of trotting a circle, to think about trotting in straight lines. Just think about trotting around the whole arena. But if he ever got too fast or unbalanced or really not thinking or anything resembling, hey, I don't really feel <laughs> feel like this is a, a, a positive <laughs> experience here, then she should just pick the nearest barrel and go, oh, hey, let's do that little move around the barrel. And not like a punishment, not like a rip them down, one rain stop, kind of thing. Everything very gentle, but, but, um, but clear, like you were going to make this move around the barrel and, um, it would be really easier if you joined me in it kind of thing. And I even gave her the, um, sort of, I love to have little mantras in my head of making sure that he, um, when she was okay with how he was going, that she kept a little loop in the rain or, touched his neck or said out loud, yes, yes moments, just somehow that she was really clear between the yes, this is great, good job, totally good. And then if he passed a certain threshold of speed or lack of balance, that she always did the same answer, which was, let's do that little bendy, bendy turn around the barrel with the mantra or the 
sentence in her head would be like, oh, hey, where were you going? <laughs> where, where were you going? You were tootling off there. So very friendly. Again, not, not a punishment, not a correction. And so she did this for a while. And, you know, I could see by the length of the reins that she was keeping and how much slack was in the rein or not. I could see sort of the level of how it felt, right? Of how, how trusting she felt, how balanced she felt, how balanced she thought he was. And during this time, I think he did knock into a barrel. He kind of ran, we had the, a big, a big ball, like one of those really, I don't know, four foot <laughs> diameter balls in the rain. And he, he ran into that, like not in a like, oh, I'm going to go kick the ball, but just like a, <laughs> here I come and bounced, bounced into the, into the ball. Uh, yeah. And so it started out as like short spurts of trot and then a lot of time turning around the barrel before he started to, you know, let loose to it, which is code for, you know, help her with it. And that's the other reason I like an exercise like this, because it's very simple. There's two things we're doing. We're letting you trot however you want to trot, or we're turning around the barrel. That's it. So as it goes, and as they start to become more conscious and more thinking, instead of just ah, <laughs> running around, you can really measure you can measure the progress. They start to be able to predict, oh, I bet you I know what's going to happen. And then they start to help you. And that's really one of the first things you want to look for is the feeling that they start to help you. You start to go into the position to do this little turn. They see the barrel. They're like, I know what's going to happen. And they start organizing their own bodies to get that to happen. I'm going to repeat that they start organizing their own bodies to get that to happen, right? Because they know what's going to happen and they're practicing it and they're gaining the coordination and you're gaining their attention and they're learning because you're repeating and they're pattern learners. So again, what's really hard about this is to not try to help or manage or control. So that's the other thing I'm looking for. So like I said, I was noticing the shorter reins. I'm looking for, you know, are there aids being used? Does it look like she's having to do some stuff to, to manage the speed or control the speed or the line of direction? And so this is where it's, it's, I think it, you need often, you need to be confident about it as a rider because it can feel scary and it can feel like you're letting the horse get too far off track or get away with something. So you have to be really conscious. You're doing an exercise that's going to give the horse some choices and allow them to learn. And that just because you let go of the reins a little bit and your horse goes flittering off somewhere, you're not failing. That's, that's the exercise. As long as you, you notice the threshold being crossed and you go, Oh, you doing this causes me to do this right? So you going faster than X miles per hour causes me to ask you, hey, where are you going? And give you somewhere else to go, i.e. around the barrel with a bendy thing. I hope that's, I hope that's painting a picture. So, um, so it's, what started to happen was, um, was she was, as she did the turns, he started to help her. And he started to let loose. He started to gain the coordination. So that was kind of the one of the first changes that we look for and reward that. So if, you know, if you first would ask and he'd be like trotting off and then you go to turn around the barrel and he knocks it over, bangs into it, sticks his head in the air, locks his shoulders, and it takes, you know, 45 seconds before you get even one step. And then through practicing it, you, he tootles off at the trot, you start to turn him around the barrel and within one quarter of the turn of the barrel, he's already there. Like he already started helping and organizing and getting it done. Then I would dwell for longer. So that, that would be, you know, if something significant changed a drop, a significant drop of progress, I would definitely point that out. And so we would stop, dwell a little longer, let him think about it give his brain time to process, give all the, you know, 
those juicy chemicals <laughs> in the brain time to kind of settle out before we went again. So, um, so the first drop of progress is he started helping us and not knocking over the barrels. <laughs> he started organizing himself. And after a little bit more fiddling around with this, he made his first real significant change, which was, and this was well into it. I mean, this might have been, gosh, 20 minutes or so um, that he did one of these turns around the barrels and he let loose to it. And then you could see his eyes change and he went, oh, there's a barrel here. And you could see for the first time, he actually looked at the barrel and got curious about the barrel. And the rider felt it. Now it was so obvious looking at his expression. I mean, it was it was literally like, oh, when did you get here? <laughs> like, Horace, you've been running into this thing for 20 minutes. But it was the first time he looked and he went, oh, there's something about this barrel. I wonder what it is. And curiosity is so, so important. If you have a horse who's been anxious and they start to show signs of curiosity, re really don't miss that moment. So it's a really powerful shift when they start to bring their attention into the here and now and they start to see things on a different level and allow themselves to start investigating, to start seeking even if it's just a, huh, I wonder what this barrel smells like. Like that is a horse wondering and investigating. And I mean, what is training? But trying to get horses to figure things out. I wonder what this exercise is for. What, it, what is that human asking me to do? It's the same, it's the same thing. It's a, <laughs> here, I'm going to give you a, you know, neuro, neuro, you know, neurophysiology chemistry lesson here. <laughs> Curiosity is like seek is this seeking the same way to train. It's a different part of the brain than the part of the brain that's that's going ah. <laughs> so, I don't know you neuroscientists find the fancy words for that, but we want the brain to turn to change from ah to ooh. What is that? Right. So when he sniffed the barrel, I right away pointed that out. She had already felt it. You know, because it's not just about the sniffing. She felt it in his body. She could feel where his neck went. Where did his neck go when he investigated the, the barrel? Out, longer, out of his withers. You know, good biomechanical kind of stuff. Not because we did some fancy rain technique to get him to stretch his neck, but because he became curious and he reached forward while he was stopping himself. So he stretched that little bit over the top line. That's a much better biomechanics from what he was doing before, which is putting his head up, his withers down, locking his shoulders and literally running into things. <laughs> so we sat there for a little while and just kind of talked about that. And we also talked about, you know, why another reason for the obstacles, because you can definitely do this same exercise without an obstacle. I could do it just through aids. You could be in the middle of a big field and go on a loose rein. And if the horse goes over a threshold of speed, you can just do a little bendy turny thing. But part of the beauty of having an obstacle, that physical object, is that it really does help bring their attention into this space, into the here and now, because it, it gives them the physical thing to look at. So that sniffing the barrel was significant, not just because it was curiosity turning on, but because he's actually looking with his eyeballs here and he, and looking at the barrel is a lot closer than, you know, before he was thinking outside the arena and kind of vague, ah, something might happen. Then he was like, you know, in the arena with this barrel that was starting to look very interesting. That's just you know, feet a foot away from where the rider is, right? So we're coming inside. He can think about his own body now. If he can think about the barrel, he can think about his own body and what to or to not run into and take care of himself. And then after he does all those things, then there's a chance that he can have 
anything resembling sophisticated communication with his human that's right there, you know, on top of him. So we let him have that dwell. He gave a big lick, sat there for a while processing. And then when, when he was done with that, uh, we went again. Oh, the other thing we talked about in this moment, and here's a teaching technique, and this is something to know for when you're writing all by yourself. Like when I have a moment like that with a student, it's, um, it's a beautiful moment for me to talk about stuff because it, it helps them stay there longer to dwell. When you're doing this all by yourself, sometimes it feels like forever to dwell. Like how long do we dwell? I don't know. <laughs> we usually don't dwell as long as we need to. So I talk about other stuff. And so I started talking about everything I've just talked to you about. And I talk about the bell curve. And we think about, again, this is, here's your lesson in, uh, you know, neurobiology. Uh, there's a bell curve. <laughs> Relaxation. And then, you know, he was relaxed at home. And then she brought him in the trailer and he came to my place. And then we're doing this exercise and the tension goes up. Now we're at the top of the bell curve. Well, we need to go all the way back down. And I wanted to make sure that we got as far back down on that bell curve as we could while we are here in this moment. Otherwise, he'd just come to my house, go up and get stressed, get all the icky chemicals, all the icky experience, and then get through it, get on the trailer, go home, and then then he would return to relaxation. So it was really, really important for this little horse, for any horse, but I, you know, it's like it's this clean, beautiful slate. Like, can we do this? So this was a moment to help make it easier to come all the way back down. And, you know, I don't know if we went all the way back down because I didn't take any blood samples or anything, but he looked, he looked pretty darn relaxed. So, um, we went one more time and one more little session and I tempted her to go on even straighter lines and kind of there was a group of barrels at one side of the arena and a group of barrels at the other side and to try to do some straight lines so she could get some longer lines and still know she has barrels on either side. And he started out so much better after this, after that, that one dwell and uh, she made a really good move in one direction and then let him dwell, a little mini dwell, and then start it again. And he did one on the on the less balanced side. He had one moment where he came around the corner and the mounting block was there, which was fine. It's another obstacle to move around. And he just plowed through it. I mean, at least the rider was turning him and he just kind of got a little tense and he, he just literally plowed over. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be it. He's going to trip. He's going to fall down or he's going to spook or a leap and you know Lisa's gonna, she's gonna the rider's gonna fall off I'm like oh no and he just went plunked over it and it was so beautiful because it was unexpected because he had been improving and the rider's reins were looser so she didn't have time to manage the situation to avoid it so he literally just ran himself into the mounting block and stumbled over it and you could see him go oh I think I have to steer myself or something like that. But he made a big adjustment. And when he came around the next corner where he had been speeding up, he dialed himself back and he dialed himself back. He went into the most beautiful posture. He straightened his own neck. He dialed himself back. He licked, he lengthened his body soft reins and then she just I mean we it was so obvious I saw it he saw it he felt it she felt it and she just sat down and he melted to a stop and then she got off and we just hung out there a little bit more and it was like yes there it is and how stinking cool is it to just set up this pattern the strategic pattern kind of like a like medicine, right? We made a diagnosis and I prescribed this pattern with some logic, thinking about the principles that we wanted it to feel good to the horse. 
right? So all these principles. And then it works. And it works because the horse discovered it. He discovered it. And then we were able to, again, ride that bell curve. So with exercises like this, it's not just about getting it done. It's about clearing and clarifying. It's about healthy nervous systems. It's about remembering that fear, confusion, and feelings of helplessness work against the posture we're trying to create. So this horse had some fear. It was just stress, unable to regulate himself. And he had confusion. He wasn't sure what speed to go or where to go. So we gave him a distinct pattern using obstacles for clarity and played with it in a way that cleared tension. We gave him time to figure things out and remember the principles that the basics of dressage are for the horse and should feel good to him, that everything comes from and returns to relaxation, and that mental, emotional, and physical development are equal doorways to our goal. So by doing it this way, we achieved our goal of better movement in a way that the horse arrived there himself with no aids at all in that moment. So this, this is the stuff. This is the stuff that's, in my humble opinion, so unique about what we teach here in Dressage Naturally, and especially this sweet spot of healthy biomechanics protocol. So this is all built in. That's why the sweet spot course starts with foundational things. And it's this way of looking at what's going on and finding the whole horse approach to improve it. So I hope that helps. I hope that helps you see how those, some of those principles can be applied in real life. All right, now before we go with this one, just one little note. In the spirit of holistic approaches, I'm gonna be making just a little tweak to this podcast, and I'm going to dare to not promise a new episode every single week. Now, chances are I'm going to be doing, you know, doing new episodes many, many weeks in a row, but I just need for my own self right now, I just need to feel a little more possibility for flexibility without stressing that I'm going to be breaking a promise. So I hate breaking promises. And I've promised an episode every week. And I don't want to not do that if I've promised it. However, (laughs) I just need a little bit more breathing room right now. So I'm going to promise that these episodes will drop on a bit more of a flexible schedule. So make sure that you officially subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen on, you know, Apple or Spotify or wherever, there should be a way to subscribe um, or to the RSS feed from my website or make sure you're on our email list because we send an email out that announces when there's a new podcast or just make sure you click to officially follow me on Facebook or Instagram and that way you won't miss a new episode when it drops. And if I don't do a new episode one week, hey, just pick a number between one and 186 and go just pick a random one. I know it'll be exactly what you need to hear. Thanks for understanding.